I know for a fact that my wrestling career is over. There is nothing that could make me go back. You're saying you've closed the door on going back to WWE. It won't ever happen. What happened? I was 100% loyal, but they were not loyal to me. How do you get Yin Yang Twins to do your entrance theme? Everybody wanted to be a part of what the WWE was doing, so it wasn't that hard to get them to do it. Who trained you? Chris Benoit trained me. You said, I'm really impressed with what MJF's doing. I think he's going to be the highest paid superstar in the history of the business. If you want to be great at what you do, you have to be an absolute expert. Making it happen in person. My, co my friend, it's so good to see you. I, I cannot believe that we're making this happen for a second time. And and it's funny because when I think of great shows and great interviews, you're like, oh, thank you, thank you. No, truly, this is one of them. And now in this whole 2023, the way content is done, you're right at the front of the line. So it's an honor Dude. that we get to sit here at my beautiful club. And chop it up for a little bit. So let's go. That's very kind of you to say we are at the Alyssa Viejo Country, Country Club. Club. Yeah. WWE must have paid you well <laughs> if you are a member here. Well, my it, goodness. It, it, it's a very nice place. <laughs> but this is really, truly all about my son. So many things have changed since my WWE days. And, you know, I now have a, a 15 year old daughter, I have a 13 year old son who's a competitive golfer. Wow. And so we had to join this place. Uh, for for his young budding golf career. What's his name? Uh, JJ. So we're going to yes. be seeing JJ Coachman <laughs> tearing it up on the PGA Tour in like five, eight years. It's his goals, and it's his goal to be on the PGA Tour. And since I work for the PGA Tour, the kind of the cool thing is is that they have a lot of different things that you can do: internships, scholarships. Uh, so even if he's not on the PGA Tour. Uh, he can still work in the world of golf. He loves it. He's such a good little player. And then for any dads out there, our relationship has grown so much because of this golf course. So I thought it'd be cool wow. to be here today. Thank you for having me here. Your son must be quite the golfer if he's playing here all the time. He is. He is so really, his, really what's good. what's his handicap? Well, juniors really don't have a handicap. Okay. So, but he shoots in the 70s every single day. In and, the and 70s? And, he, yeah, and this is a Jack Nicklaus course, and uh, he plays in tournaments now, and so he routinely will shoot between 75 and 80, and he's only played for two and a half years. That's incredible. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun so to watch him play. golf's a big part of your life It now. is now, yeah. I think there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of wrestling fans that, like, when you leave wrestling, they're like, well, I guess he just fell off the face of the planet. No, you're more successful than ever right now. It's funny because I find social media funny, and I tell anybody who asks me, you can't believe almost anything on social media. I won't say everything, but almost anything. Because I have people who tweet at me, oh, where have you been? You've done nothing with your career. Oh, I mean, your career stopped in 2008. Did it really? Mm -hmm. I mean, 10 years doing Sports Center, and now at CBS Sports. I work for the PGA Tour. I do all the betting content for the PFL, uh, the only MMA league that has a regular season of playoffs and a championship night coming up in November. So, um, the, the thing that most wrestling fans don't realize is in their minds, they think everybody aspires to be in the WWE, aspires yeah. to be uh, uh, in, in pro wrestling. I never did. I stumbled into it. I backed into it. I was lucky to, to even get into it when I'm 23 years old. But my dream was always sports. And part of the reason I left ESPN in 2017 is I wanted to do more golf. And I knew that after 20 some years of doing things my way, it's time for me to start helping. And what I mean by that is there needs to be diversity in everything and in the world of golf, especially when you have Tiger Woods, who's a black man, as your most popular golfer of all time mm -hmm. for the last 25 years. But yet that's not represented on television or in in golf in general. So that's what I wanted to do. And now I'm a big part of what the PGA Tour does. Um, and I just love being in the world of golf. We need to talk about the fact that you haven't aged a single <laughs> minute in the last 15 years since we, you know, since we saw you regularly in WWE. It's funny because recently I posted a picture of myself today. And somebody had sent me a picture from 2007. Yeah. I posted it right, right next to each other. And people thought 2007 was today and that today's picture was 2007. I've been very, very lucky um, that my skin is holding up, that my, you know, I feel great physically. I feel better than ever. My spirits are up. Uh, I'm super positive and I'm just enjoying life right now. You also have this energy and this charisma that is so infectious, not just with us talking here, but like with every single person you've interacted with here at the club. Where does that come from? I love people for one, 
And I, th- I think that's always been kind of the big misconception about me because a lot of times I'll use the coach character professionally. And as you know, now you almost have to be on 24-7. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people that think that the guy that they saw from 1999 to 2008, that that's really me. Well, like The Rock always likes to say, that's you turned up 10 notches. But at my core, because I'm adopted. You know, my parents, my dad was United Methodist p- pastor. He had a heart transplant five years ago. And when you go through all of that and you're raised that way, innately you're taught to be kind, which is what we all should be doing. And so my mother never watched one second of me in the WWE. When I left and went to the ESPN, I remember the first phone call, and she was like, oh, I can watch you now. <laughs> she hated pro wrestling. And so that, that was my upbringing. And, and then my life the last five years has been really good. It's been up and down but it, because of COVID. But because of my dad's heart transplant, I've realized that you literally never know, A, when it's going to end, mm. B, when you're going to get a second chance, mm. uh, C, how it's going to affect everybody around you. So you never know what other people are going through. So just like what you've seen here at the club with all the different people, I try to be kind to everybody Mm. because it might help their day and then they might help somebody else. And when I'm on the air every day, I end the show by saying, be kind to one another. Mm. And, And I really believe that. The Rock always says it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And ever since he said that, I've never forgotten it because it's, it's such a true thing of like, yeah, it's nice to be important, but it's really important to be nice to everybody. I'll never forget the first day I met him, August 24th, 1999, which just happens to be Vince McMahon's birthday as Mm. well. And we were in Kansas City, and we were still kind of figuring out, you know, if I was going to come. I'd already done the interview. And I remember standing there, and you can imagine, you're in the early 20s, and this was when The Rock was really taking off. The WWE was really taking off. And I remember standing there at Kemper Arena in Kansas City, which had a lot of things happen over the years, obviously, and watching him walk in and thinking, this is the coolest human being I've ever seen in my life. And how he interacted with the security guards, with people in catering and things like that, and then getting to work so closely with him for the next two or three years, watching how he treats people, even to this day is amazing to me and he also he brings it up all the time he never forgets seven dollars in his pocket coming out of college never had that opportunity and that's what drove him Mm. i feel like now i've been given the opportunity in my career to do more Mm. and i always think about that because he never stops and he never stops but people love working with him even when he gets in a spat he figures out a way how to make it positive you know what i mean whether it's vin diesel whether whatever it is and I've said this many times, nobody has taught me more about performing, interacting with people at a macro level uh, than him. Wow. And I think that you mentioned this in our last interview, but the fact that he let you say your name during that segment and then he turned it into the it doesn't matter. That's so good. I I think back now. um, I'm kind of in that reflective point of my life now because I know for a fact that my wrestling career is over. There is nothing that could make me go back and do that. So now you get into a reflective state. Nothing. 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 When people say that in wrestling, then they end up showing up a few years later. Yeah, but it's usually people that their lives are wrestling. You know what I mean? That that, that's what they aspire to be. That's not who I aspire to be. I got lucky. Um, And then there were things that happened in the last five years that make me not want to go back. You know, I was 100% loyal to that company and to to Vince. So when things happen, sometimes you got to draw a line in the sand and say, I can't be treated that way Mm. and still go back and be loyal to that company. It's not like they need me anyway. They're not crying over spilt milk, but I like to think I treat people a certain way Mm -hmm. and I want to be treated that way. Um, So yeah, I I would never go back. So I reflect now. And when I think about the, the cool things that people have done for me when I was in the WWE, whether it's fans, wrestlers, whatever, um, that mates might still be the coolest thing. And it was my very first night on the air. I'd already been there for a few months, but yeah. the first time for him to do that um, was still such a cool thing. And, and I have people that will send it to me every now and then on Instagram or whatever, but it's completely unselfish, um, which a lot of people – I hate when people say, oh, The Rock was selfish back then. Everybody had to be selfish back then. People don't understand. They look at what it is now. 
you hear it all the time. The best time of wrestling was the Attitude Era. It was 2000 to 2004 because you had – imagine having 15 LeBron James. Mm. And then your NBA Finals or your Super Bowl is only two guys. And you got 15 guys that can be in that spot. Well, that's what you aspire to be. Yeah. You're talking about a million-dollar bonus to be in the main event at WrestleMania. Would you be unselfish? Or, I mean, would you be selfish? Yeah. 100% you would be. So when I hear that narrative about The Rock was selfish back in the day, you would be too. Stone Cold was selfish. Triple H was selfish. Undertaker was selfish. Shawn Michaels was selfish. Mick Foley was selfish. They had to be because everybody fought to get in that spot. If more people and wrestlers fought today to get in that spot – I think we'd have better storylines. We'd have more competition. We'd have better promos. We'd have quicker whatever. I really mm. believe that. So you think that wrestlers now should be adopting what we saw 20-plus years ago? It's hard. It's hard to say, yes, they should, because I know how it works. And sometimes when you run your mouth or you're too aggressive, you can be – taken off TV. And if you're off TV, then it doesn't matter how good you are. Yeah. You know, so it, it, you got to play the game. It's just back then, guys were so confident in their characters and they were so confident in what they were doing. Mm. And the crowd reaction was incredible. Um, and to watch all the guys I just named, you could put any two of them yeah. interchangeably and that'd be a great main event at yeah. a WrestleMania or a SummerSlam or whatever. Okay, there's lots more to get to in this great conversation with the coach. But this episode is brought to you by Z-Biotics. And I always found like when I was going out for a drink or two, or maybe four or five, that you had to make a choice. You either had a great night or you had a great day the next day, but not both. That is until I found Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's actually this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. So look, Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Make sure you stock up on Z-Biotics pre-alcohol before you feast. And let me tell you, you will be thankful that you did. So go to zbiotics.com slash CVV and you'll get 15% off your first order when you use that code CVV at checkout. And by the way, it's backed by a 100% money back guarantee. So if for whatever reason you're not feeling it, they've got you covered. It's zbiotics.com slash CVV. Get 15% off with that code CVV. When you watch back that debut, it's amazing just the confidence you had, the swagger you had, because when I look back at like my first show and wherever it was, where, where, whatever market I was in, you could tell I was a little bit nervous, excited to be there, but a little bit nervous. Yeah. You, you got this real swagger about you in that segment. I've always had it, you know, and, and I love to, to talk to colleges and high schools now whenever I have the opportunity because you have to be able, no matter what it is, and pro wrestling is probably the hardest to let yourself go because you're always being judged, whether it's by the fans. Uh, and, and the fans, are they loyal? Yes, but wrestling fans, man, they can be brutal mm. as far as what they expect from you. So I just said screw it. And I said, this is who I'm going to be. I knew that I was a good speaker, talker, whatever you want to call it. And I said for years when I was there and since, if I speak to anybody, you have to be able to talk. You've got to show people, especially when you're doing Monday Night Raw or SmackDown or whatever, you cannot go out there and be timid. Yeah. You can't go out there. This is pro wrestling. This is a character. This is your acting and you're showing off. How do you do that without swagger? You know, I also knew that I didn't know I was ever going to get in the ring, but I knew that I had the ability to do anything that Vince asked me to do. Yeah. And he ended up asking me to do everything. And I did it. I'm very proud of that. Um, but you have to let yourself go. You do, if, you, if you don't, you'll never get or reach your potential. So what do you think is the difference between Jonathan Coachman and the coach? Well, I told somebody this the other day. I haven't had a first name since I was two. So <laughs> I don't even know if Jonathan Coachman exists. Uh, somebody yelled Jonathan, and uh, I was in Target a few weeks ago. I didn't even turn until, like, oh, they're talking to me. I've always been the coach, you know. And a funny story happened when I was at ESPN. Seth Greenberg, who I respect a lot, you know, he coached, you know, Long Beach State, Virginia Tech. And, and I did halftime segments with him, 
and Jay Williams. And I used to say, you know, you come back, Kansas playing Oklahoma, let's say. And, all right, let's send it to the studio and, 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 the, and a halftime report. And I'd come on and say, all right, alongside Jay Williams, Seth Greenberg, and the coach. And so Seth, it must have been boiling up inside of him because one night <laughs> he stops me as I'm doing, you know, I always say, don't ruin my flow. Don't ruin my flow. Right. So he ruins my flow and he goes, hey, I, you know, and, and you know how you're starting a segment. There's certain things you got to hit. Yeah. So he goes, oh, I can remember when I was the coach. I can remember when people respected me enough to call me the coach. Well, unfortunately, my swagger and overconfidence said, I've got to say this. So I said to him on TV, when you can walk into Toys R Us and buy your action figure, then and only then <laughs> will I call you the coach. <laughs> and the look on his face was like, did he really say that to me? A man with 300-plus Division I basketball <laughs> wins? And that's what he's going to say to me? Yeah, I said that to him. So the difference between Jonathan – Jonathan Coachman is a really, really nice guy. I try to help whenever possible. You talk to anybody that I work with now at CBS, at the Early Edge, whatever – it is a situation where I got reprimanded for that, um, and probably rightfully so. But when you're the coach, and this is what I tried to tell people when I was, was at ESPN, and you see it now on the early edge, which is my brand, every single person has a nickname. Why do I do that? Hmm. And my bosses at CBS said, why do you do this? Why does everybody have to have a nickname? Why can't it just be Larry Hartstein or uh, Matthew Snyder? Why can't it just be that? Yeah. I said, how many Matts are there in the world? Mm. How many Larrys are there in the world? How many Chrises are there in the world? A lot. I said, a lot, yeah. right? Jonathan is a hard name to say. It's three syllables. People that aren't on air, yeah. they don't think about flow. Yeah. They don't think about things that are easy to say. Saying the coach, see how easy that is? Yeah. But you say Jonathan coach, that's five syllables. Yeah. That's a lot. So when I come on the show every day, and now I don't hear it anymore because we have such a successful brand, it's funny how that works, mm. right? And I say, hey, welcome into the early edge. I'm the coach. If I said I'm Jonathan, Co it's like, it's like, it's like, you know. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a mindset. Yeah. It's a, it's for branding. And it's also the coach is this guy that can do anything. Mm. And that's also one of the things I'm most proud of. Wrestling fans tease me all the time. Oh, you've done nothing, as I said, but. I literally have done everything. Mm. But in their minds, they only care about wrestling, yeah. right? Most wrestling fans don't watch sports. So when I left wrestling, in their minds, I just left. But I literally opened the door for eight to ten people that have left WWE because I was the first one. There had never been anybody to go from WWE to a major national platform network straight away yeah it had never happened before yeah and when i got there i dealt with a lot of blowback from executives at espn because they didn't want the wrestling guy calling real sports it didn't matter how good i was they didn't want the wrestling guy calling real sports wow so that's when i was i said you know what i'm gonna be the coach all the time they literally sit down an email at one point and said no more nicknames and they wow. put in there you can't call cf chris fowler cf Nobody's ever called Chris Fowler CF, right? <laughs> and they said, Herbie can still be Herbie, Herb Street, and uh, Chris Berman can still be Boomer. But everybody else, and I was like, they wrote that just for me. Wow. And I'm going to double down. And so then I got into radio, and I had a show, and I was the coach in every single step of the way, which has led me to 2023. And now everything is flipped. And so now if you don't have a personality, if you don't have a nickname, if you don't have a brand, yeah. what are you? Yeah, you're definitely not a Jonathan. Like you could right. be, you could be a Johnny, you could be a JC maybe, yep. but you're not a Jonathan. Not at all. No. Except if you talk to my mother and that's it. <laughs> that's it. But you certainly don't call me John either. Cause my mom will, will light you up. Mm. Uh, but to me in, 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 in sports and sports and entertainment, and I want whoever's watching this to understand this, that if you want to get into this, whether it is content creating, whether it's being a a net. I mean, I'm talking at the highest level. I mean, I'm not talking about getting into local TV or whatever, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to get to the absolute highest level, yeah. you have got to do this. You've got to create something that makes people remember you, yeah. that make people go, man, I know that guy. Because there's a million different things out there now, whether you're an influencer, which I think that's kind of is reaching the end of, I think companies are realizing just because I pay 
that guy to do that thing. Yeah. I'm not getting value out of that. Yeah. And sports books are doing the same thing. They're realizing just because I'm paying a celebrity to do a commercial doesn't mean that somebody's going to bet with my company. Yeah. You got to be smarter. You got to think outside the box. And so if you're a kid, I say kid, 21, 22, and you want to do this business now. Yeah. You can't just be a writer. Yeah. You got to be able to write, but that can't be it. Yep. You got to be able to do everything. And that's that's who the coach is. The coach is the guy that does everything. And the coach is a trusted brand. And that's kind of what you're saying here. It's not just about like building up your personal brand. It's about like you're now the betting guy. Yep. When you say something, when you put out, you know, I'm going to take this team over this team or I'm going to take the over the under, people trust you yeah. because you've been doing this for so long. Yeah, and trust is a big, big word. Yes. And that part, as much fun as we have and as much joking around as we do, and it's a lot, um, you have to take that part seriously because this is real money we're talking about. This, this is people's hard-earned money. And then there's, there's still the portion of the, of the public, like you're, you're promoting something bad. Well, here's a dirty little secret, Chris Van Vliet. Uh-oh. All these people, they're doing it anyway, right? It became legal just a few years ago, but they were doing it anyway. Yeah. And so we just try to have them do it more responsibly and make it fun because a lot of the old school guys are super serious. You know, the hat on backwards, the sunglasses, and I'm talking to, you know, a little on the street. We don't do that. We're transparent. We like to have a good time. We like to have fun. And when people come to watch our show, yeah. they're going to laugh. And they're also going to remember the names. And whether, I mean, just some of the names we have on our show is the sniper, the snake. <laughs> we have a guy named Buckets. Uh, Larry Harstein is a maestro. Why is he the maestro? Because he kind of runs everything at Sportsline. So he's the maestro, right? We've got uh, a guy named uh, Alan Bell. He's our five-tool player. Why? Because he produces, he's an on-air talent, he can do everything. He's a five-tool player. It's a baseball reference. Yeah. So everything makes sense. And I now have the creativity and the freedom and the staff and the crew, we call them the crew too, and everything is branded. Everything I do is branded, and that I did learn from Vince. That feels like it's right out of Vince McMahon's it playbook. Is. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with Vince? Not at all. So that, like, you're saying you've closed the door on going back to WWE. Won't ever happen. What specifically happened? So, um, I went back in 2017. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of instantly knew this is not really where I need to be, where I want to be. But it was a nice bridge between ESPN and, and what the next full-time thing was going to be. Um, so, in my personal life, I was moving to California. So, I didn't really know what I was going to do next. And so, I went back. And it was, it was fun, but the people I worked with on the shows – a, I don't know what, what it was, but didn't really want me to be there. Mm. So when I got switched to the, um, the, pre-show. the pre-show, that was fun because that was just once a month I had to show up. And that was cool. But then I missed, and part of the reason, and this is so Vince, when they called me and they said, hey, we'd love for you to come back. I said, I'm already doing golf. So I had five events already booked. And I said, I'm missing the shows that week. Like, oh, no problem, no problem, until it was a problem. Mm. And so I missed one show in 10 years in my first run. I missed five shows in the first seven months of my second run. But I think everybody would agree, and the schedule has changed now. They were running people into the ground. Mm. Nobody should be working 52 weeks a year, nobody. They shouldn't be having new shows 52 weeks a year, let's be honest. Yeah. And everybody inside WWE says it, they just don't want to admit it. But n no company should work that way. But for me, what it was, I'll just be honest with you, Chris, is they came to me and they said, XFL 2020, and Vince needs somebody there that he trusts that can do it the right way. So I was flying from California to New York every week mm. to do the pre-show because they hired a lot of people that never worked for him before. So I, I trust Vince implicitly. Like, I've done so much for him, with him. Everybody knows that. And so you, you turn in invoices, right? Well... I didn't turn mine in right away because I'd worked for him for 20 years. He had always paid me. Sure. Right. So um, COVID happens and I have a fairly large check and I hold on to it for a couple of days. I go put it in the bank. It bounces. Wow. It bounces. And so I called or texted um, a high executive there and I got a response. Oh, that's a lot of money. I said, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I said, can you just call Vince? Let's take care of this quietly. No big deal. Yeah. And um, ghosted me. Wow. Absolutely ghosted me. And, you know, 
Vince has the amount of money in his back pocket. You know what I mean? And it really hit me hard. And it wasn't the it wasn't the money. It was the the process. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That and I, I sat there. I'll, I'll never forget, Chris. I sat there one day and and I'm sitting there going, man, they they really bounced a check to me. Oh, I, I did get a second text. It was like, oh, that's another company. I don't think there's anything we can do. So basically telling me uh, people I'd worked with for 20 years. Oh, that's the XFL. It's not the WWE. There's no, but the same guy owns the two. Yeah. Right. And he, I mean, everything was a crossover. So that to me was a complete slap in the face. Mm. And, but some people there just don't care. And I'm not going to name names. It's not my style, but even to this day, and anybody that watches this interview will agree with me because it's true. There are certain people, and they're usually the ones that get the biggest bonuses, that do not care what happens below them. And I had literally done everything I had ever been asked to do. And this is how you're going to treat me? Mm. And literally, they didn't care. They did not care. And I even gave it months because they were going through. Remember, there was no, there was no shows. The company's yep. losing money. I felt for all of that. But then eight months later, when you start advertising, biggest year we've ever had financially, making all this money, and then you can't make things right. Yeah. So, again, that's why I've, I've never really talked about it. I've, I've mentioned it in a couple of interviews. But I can't, at this point in my life, I can't work for people like that. Yeah. I, I, I cannot work for people who do not care about human beings to the point that in a very in a in a spot where you really need it, because we all lost our jobs during COVID, and that's when you're going to decide to go. Ah, let's just turn our back on a guy who's been loyal for 20 years. Mm. Like to a point, the things that I've done for that company really bad. You know, would blow your mind. Would blow your mind. Yeah. I was 100% loyal, but they were not loyal to me. And that's it. That's too bad to hear. Because yeah. you, were, you were the guy that you weren't just the backstage interviewer. Yeah. You were wearing so many hats there. And, I mean, the fact that you mentioned that you had an action figure. Yeah. How many backstage interviewers had an action figure? <laughs> that's crazy. You know, what's crazy is that, that my ego was so big at one point <laughs> that I actually thought that people cared if I bought my own action figure. So I borrowed a credit card <laughs> that had somebody else's name on it <laughs> and bought 10 of my own action figure. And as, as I look back on that over the years, I was like, Literally nobody cares. Nobody cares if you buy because I think we all would buy our own action figures. Of course. And the way it's done, just so people know, WWE doesn't make these action figures. It's a company and they license them. So the company is not in the the, the business of giving you, yeah. you know, hey Chris, here's a hundred, you know, because that would that mean they would lose money. Yeah. So you kind of have to buy your own. Um, but I was happy to because when you're growing up, you think about really two things: being in a video game and an action figure. Mm. And I was able to not only get that, I, I was able to get my own uh, entrance music, which I loved. It was uh, so good. And those $17 checks that I still get every three months, <laughs> it's somehow somebody's still buying that album. I have no idea. But I get a check every three months for $17. Your, your heel entrance music, it's a, it's a banger. Thank you. Yin Yang Twins. It's Yin so Yang good. Twins. How do you get Yin Yang Twins to do your entrance theme? Well, you got to remember, I was there at the hottest time. Yes. And so... Everybody was answering the phone. I mean, you got to remember, they're paying Kid Rock, who knows how much money, to borrow a song for The Undertaker for six months. And so then when the DVD comes out or the home video, they have to take that song out because they only bought it for six months. Yeah. That's how hot things were back then. So everybody wanted to be a part of what the WWE was doing. So it wasn't that hard to get them to do it. Man. Are you watching a lot of wrestling now? Zero. <laughs> Zero. I, I, I keep up on social media, but... Um, I, I'm just so busy with sports, and at night it's do I watch the games or do I watch – well, I tell my son all the time that if you want to be great at what you do, yeah. then you have to be an absolute expert. And you've got to – and this is a saying that I live by. I work really, really hard when nobody's watching to make it look really, really easy when everybody's watching. Mm. So I work my tail off when you're not watching. So then when I'm on a show and I'm on an interview, I'd be like, man, and it just pops off the top of my head and go, man, he knows everything. Well, I work at it too. Yeah. And so it's a combination of I'm doing sports and I just don't care. <laughs> I literally do not care about wrestling anymore. And I feel bad because I still have a lot of friends that I worked with there and hopefully that it's still fun for them. But until they change the schedule and the travel and all that kind of stuff um, and the three hour shows, 
got to remember back when I started, part of the competition that we talked about at the start of this interview, mm -hmm. there's only a two hour show. Yeah. So when they switched to three hour shows, we all hated it. But what can you do? It's Vince's call. Yeah. And the network sort of, like, hey, yeah, give me another hour instead of, you know, running the voice or whatever for an hour. So when you add a third hour, now you're bringing the rock out twice. Mm. Now you're bringing Stone Cold out twice. You, to me, you get that one big pop. And so but the formula was you bring them out, they talk at the start of the show, set up the main event, yeah. and then you see them at 1055. Yeah. That worked. But when you bring them out at 8 o'clock, and now you're waiting three hours, yeah. and now you're having multiple segment matches, and it's just like it, everything changed to get more TV money. And that, to me, that changed the show. And still to this day, it should only be two hours. It certainly feels like the competition now from AEW is is helping things out for everybody. Like sure. rising tides lift all ships. And I feel like over the last four years, AEW has upped the game for everybody. WWE is definitely showing up. Wrestling fans need to understand, especially new wrestling fans who, and I don't know how, how it got this way, Chris, but wrestling fans think they know everything. Like, I know everything about everything. I invented the, the business of pro wrestling. And I tell them all the time, literally, you could not walk one day in our shoes. You couldn't do it. And I remember years ago at WrestleMania, they used to set up a thing where we would call matches with fans. Mm. And I wish you could do that today. Anybody that wants to be a troll or a hater, guess what? You're going to sit down at that table, and you're going to call that match. You know everything about everything? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see you call it when somebody's screaming in your ear. Let's see you call it when you're trying to weave storylines into a match and call the moves all at the same time. Wrestling fans, I wish, could take a step back. Just enjoy it for what it is because yeah. it is entertainment. And quit trying to guess what's going to be on the show. Quit reading the dirt sheets. Quit reading all these things because, oh, by the way, all these dirt sheet writers – I've never seen one of them backstage, mm. ever, ever. So how do they know all this stuff? You know, and most of the time it's wrong. But people don't realize in wrestling media that if you throw something against the wall, most of the time people don't care because it's not real journalism, right? Yeah. So when you do get a story right, that's when you're going to run with See, I was right. I called that right there. But most of the time you're wrong. And I wish wrestling fans could realize that. Listen to people like me or people that have actually spent time not only in the business, but doing the business yeah. and living the business, yeah. not just somebody who is guessing at what's going to happen. It seems like the element of surprise is not there anymore in pro wrestling. And it's funny because if we're going to go see a Marvel movie and you're seeing it on opening night and I'm not seeing it till Sunday, I'm going, Coach, don't tell me a thing. Don't tell me a thing. But if someone might possibly make a big return or a big appearance in wrestling, we're scrolling through Twitter and trying to figure out, are they going to be there or not? A couple of weeks ago, you remember when Rock came back at, mm. at Colorado? And it, it's so funny. it was so funny to me to see the negativity surrounding Coach Prime and Colorado and all of that. But when you really step back and you look at all of that, how can it be anything but negative? You had college game day. You also had the Fox show there as well. The Rock shows up to be the guest picker. And yet, because they just ignored SmackDown, which happened to be in the same city, Rock comes out and the place absolutely loses their mind. Yeah. It made me think of years ago in San Diego, and I've told this story on, on your show, with me and Eugene, and The Rock called the office and said, hey, I'm in L.A., you guys are going to be in San Diego, let's do something. Yeah. Well, one thing that Vince is avid about, and I'll never forget him threatening us in a meeting on one week where, where Linda McMahon and Mick Foley were going to be a big surprise. It leaked onto a dirt sheet. And he literally said, and I quote, you do not want to be in this room if I find out it's you wow. that is talking to the dirt sheets. Wow. And it literally ticked him off so badly because the art of the business, the reason that makes the business so beautiful at times is the surprise. Mm -hmm. So when I go back to San Diego and I'm like, man, The Rock wants to work with us. Mm -hmm. You know, after all these years, he's coming back to work with me and Eugene. And when people watch that, it, it was supposed to be a 12 minute segment. We're, we're practicing backstage because we snuck Rock in in a car with tinted windows. Nobody knew he was there. And it, you know, it's a five o'clock start. So the sun's still our six o'clock start, whatever. And so the fans are just kind of just barely getting to the show. It was a perfect scenario. Yeah. But when I'm making fun of Eugene, and I said to Rock when we were in the private room, I said, this feels longer than 12 minutes. And if people go back and watch now, it's like 23 minutes. And I'll never forget, he looked at me and he goes, what have I always taught you? And I said, a lot of things. And he says, I've always taught you that if it's great and you know it's great, mm. there's nothing they can say.
Mm. And that's how The Rock always lived. And it probably helped that Triple H had the crossover match that particular night, too, and they were bitter rivals at that point of their careers. But that's always stuck with me, is that if it's great and what you're doing is great and you know it's great, there's nothing they can say. Mm. And so we went out there, and it was electric for 23 minutes. And it was one of the first times that I got to talk trash back to him. But as I watched that back, and I've watched it several times over the years, it has helped me in my sports career. Wow. Every time somebody says to me, no, that can't work, I'm like, nope, it can work. I know it's going to be great. Mm. And I believe in that. And, and that's why what I'm doing now is such a success because I know what I'm doing is right and the people I'm working with, it's right. Yeah, The Rock coming back on SmackDown recently could have been a massive rating if they said, The Rock's going to be here tomorrow night on SmackDown. Instead, they made it this huge surprise. It ended up being arguably one of the greatest SmackDowns maybe ever. And then the numbers on social media ended up being huge, which is a huge... That's the number. That, that's the thing. It's the social media. Yeah. What we realize at CBS and the early edge is social media is so important. Yeah. And that's where a lot of ad dollars are at as well. They're hidden. But that's where you get them. And you take those, just like you do on your show so well, and you take little clips and you post them. That was the magic yeah. that I mean, night. Why do you think we're drinking F3 Energy here right there now? There you go. <laughs> Delicious. But they could have said The Rock's going to be here. Everybody mm. would have tuned in. But all you'd be doing, because if The Rock was the last segment, all you'd be doing is going, when's The Rock going to show up? When's The Rock going to show up? When's The Rock going to show up? It wouldn't even have been that quiet. Here's what, what used to happen back in the day. If people knew or there was a rumor of somebody. So I think that segment was what? L.A. Knight, I think, at SmackDown? It was, it was Pat McAfee. Oh, it was, Pat and, McAfee and, with and, L.A. Knight, no, right? No, with Austin Theory. Austin Theory. Okay, so Austin Theory. So if it would have been leaked, then fans would have been screaming yeah. while they're trying to do their business. Yeah, Rocky, before, Rocky. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's why you don't do it. Mm. Because Vince has always been about the show ahead of the ratings. He's always believed, at least I think, because I was around him a lot, that the show will bring the ratings. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. And that night, it was the right thing to do. On one-offs, it's not worth a one-off rating to ruin the reaction that you got in the building that night. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think the other thing that maybe not everybody's clued in on is that was the first show they did after the Endeavor deal. So, like... You know, the Endeavor deal goes through. Then The Rock and John Cena are on SmackDown a few days later. Looks pretty good for shareholders. Yeah, 100%. And that's the other thing you have to think about. And you got to remember, when I started in the WWE, they were just becoming a publicly traded company. In fact, I came like six months after. So I didn't get any stock or anything like that. <laughs> but things started changing then. I mean, it, the show was pretty risque back in the day. Yeah. And then when you have to start answering to people that are investing in your company, that changes everything. Mm. Some would argue that... That was the beginning of the non-risque part of Monday Night Raw, was when you have to answer to people who are saying, I hated that last night. My young daughter or my young son can't watch that. Well, you got to answer for that now, right? And that, that was a big difference. That was my dad, by the way. What was it? There you go. There you go. <laughs> my, we, you know, we lived and grew up in Canada and Toronto, so we had basements. you know. And my dad would come and stand in front of the TV. And be like, you are not watching this. Yeah, yeah. And look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> it's your life. It's your life. You texted me something before this interview, and you said, I'm really impressed with what MJF's doing. Yeah. You said, he's playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So there are, there are very few people that in the history of the business have figured it out. And when I watched this kid a few years ago, and he was just young and didn't even have a home and I mean, a home for wrestling. I mean, and I'm watching this arrogance and I'm like, boy, how would that play in the WWE locker room? And not only did he not stop, he kept doubling down. Yeah. And what did he have that everybody else doesn't have? He can talk better than anybody else. Yeah. So he knows. What did we just say? If you know, it's great. They can't say anything. No. When he does little things, like the other day I saw a video where he's reading the names, and he said Edge and Tony Khan, and it's like, rrr, 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 <laughs> because you can't use the same name. He goes, Adam Copeland. He does that on purpose. Mm. He's so – that's what I'm saying. He's playing chess. He knew he, he was supposed to say Adam Copeland, but he knew that if he said that, then Tony's going to be off camera, and there's literally nothing Tony can do. Yeah. I believe this to be true. Stone Cold Steve Austin made the most money for Vince over the years. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about salary, how much guys make, 
Stone Cold Rock probably topped out between five and ten million dollars a year. You know, and then they were the ones that really got that what we call the downside guarantee as high as it's ever been. Cena was up there too, meaning even if you get hurt, this is how much money you're going to make. Sure, most fans don't realize that's how it works. So I think MJF, when he becomes a free agent, because how many guys have the guts? Think about this: how many guys have the guts a year or two before your contract's up to say publicly, "Don't even think about coming to me with some weak." offer before my deal's up because I don't care what's on that piece of paper I'm going to be a free agent Mm. think about how many guys in the business today and you would know a lot better than me have the guts to say that and then nobody crushes them yeah right I haven't heard anybody go oh whoa he's putting his career in jeopardy is he really I think he's going to be the highest paid superstar in the history of the business when he becomes a free agent I feel like Tony Khan is going to back up the Brinks truck you have to. You have He's to. He's losing too many guys right now. And when you have a guy like him who is right now arguably, arguably the number one superstar in the world, you could argue that. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, everybody goes, well, look at the, the run that Roman Reigns has had. Of course. But I'm saying if you were to have a draft today, who would be your number one pick? Yeah. Throw them all into the hat. He's definitely a contender. Contender. Yeah. So if that's the case, and this is the other thing that, that – that makes me laugh when I see fans complaining on social media. I just saw Edge went over to AEW and a, a woman named Jade. Jade Cargill. Uh, Jade Cargill. Yeah. Uh, she looks like a superstar, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm reading all these really good reviews of her. And so they just switched, yeah. right? And people, oh, I can't believe she would leave. I can't believe he would go there. I was there when we – during the Monday Night Wars. I was there. There is nothing like competition. Can you imagine the NFL with two teams – Right. This is the entertainment business. And in the entertainment business, whether you're in movies, there's four or five uh, studios that bid for a movie. Yep. Well, you don't think you make more money on that movie yeah. if there's five bids? Yeah. Of course. So fans need to understand that the more legit big time wrestling companies there are. Yeah. That's good for everybody. Yeah. It's good for everybody. There's never been a better time for wrestling than right now because. All of our friends have places to work. Correct. All of our friends are getting paid way more than they would have been paid in 2015 mm-hmm. because there's options. 100%. And the WWE probably would never admit to this, but any business would do this. If Chris Van Vliet was sitting in front of me and Chris wanted $500,000 a year, and there's three companies sitting at the table that you're thinking about working for, obviously you have a better chance of getting that money. Sure. Right? So the WWE knew... We're the only game in town. Yep. So there was only a few guys that got market value. And that also speaks to how Vince does business. When Vince believes that you're worth something, yeah. he will pay you no questions asked. Yeah. If he does not, we've seen what happens then too. What do you think was the moment or the segment that really impressed Vince for you? Because you weren't just the guy in the background asking questions and holding yeah. a mic. I don't know if it was one one moment, but because we had shows early on Wednesday morning, I had to fly back on the private plane every Tuesday night with him. And everybody was, oh, it must be so cool. You're flying on a private jet with Vince. It, it kind of sucked <laughs> because the rule was, and I don't know what the rules are today, but you could only sleep when Vince sleeps. Well, he doesn't sleep on the plane. He drinks red <laughs> wine. And so you're back there, you're somewhere over in Nebraska, and you're like, oh, my God, three more hours, and this is torture. And all your buddies are back partying after SmackDown, you know. So I think what it was that triggered him, because I, I was such a good talker, I hosted all the press conferences. I hosted the first three Tough Enoughs. I was a part of the first three Diva searches. So all of the ancillary stuff, the shoulder programming, I was the host of it. So he got to see firsthand because he was always there for everything. I would always introduce him. And he saw how good I was at all the different uh, scenarios that he put me in. And then I was also big, meaning I'm 6'3 and a half. I walk around between 240, 280 pounds, depending on the year, right? And so I, do, I was doing an interview, and it was a tag team interview that was going to end in a fight. Well, whoever I was interviewing, we have a little secret, and you spread your legs out and make the guy look and put them in front of you, yeah. and it makes the person look taller. Yeah. Well, the problem was that the camera, cameraman widened out too quickly. And all of a sudden, I'm standing there with my legs completely. And all of a sudden, 
the other tag team came in late, and it was just a bad segment altogether. And Vince was furious because it kind of gave away a couple of our secrets. Yeah. So he's like, you can't do interviews anymore. You're bigger than half the roster. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we've got to figure this out. And so he came up to me in the, in the, the, uh, the gym at the WWE headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut. He goes, hey, we have an idea. Would you want to be uh, an in-ring performer? But before you say yes, you will have to get into the ring and you will have to train before shows every single day. And that's how I started doing house shows. Wow. Is I would go on the road Friday through Sunday and I would either have a match because it was on, wasn't on TV or I would be the ring announcer. And at the end of the show, it would allow a heel to win because you never want the heel to win because the fans go home unhappy. Yeah. So with me, the heel could win and then the baby face would put me through a table or they would beat me up and that's how the show would end. And so I agreed to do that. And so I could then train quietly, so to speak. And that's kind of the scenario that happened. So it wasn't one moment. Who trained you? Chris Benoit trained me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. How, how did he become the guy handpicked to train you? Um, I don't know exactly how it happened. We always got along very, very well. Um, I know there's a lot of different reactions to the name Chris Benoit uh, over the years. Uh, but my experience with him um he was really good to me you know and he took the ser he, he took the business very seriously um sometimes maybe too seriously um but he not only trained me on moves but he trained me uh on just being tough the first 15 or 20 minutes of every session was shoot fighting, like MMA training. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I trained with Shane McMahon, too. So when it, we were back in Stanford, Shane would come down and train me, so I'd have somebody in the ring with me. Uh, and then on the road, uh, Chris would, would train me. And uh, I'll never forget. I mean, he – and then I would get done with a match, and he would critique the match with me. And uh, he was just um, – I don't know. I, I, have, I have mixed emotions when I talk about him. Sure. You know, so. Yeah, I just – I feel like up until that last weekend of his life, when you look at his entire in-ring career, one of the greatest of all time mm -hmm. with his technical ability. But he's also an example that I used to use. Obviously, you don't want to use him as an example very often. But I used to tell young kids, because I ran this room on the road called the pre-tapes room, and they would come in and, and try out their character or whatever. And I tell kids all the time, I don't care how good you are in the ring. Chris Benoit never got to his potential because he couldn't talk. Mm. He was never, he was kind of an introvert and he, he wasn't comfortable on the mic and he let his wrestling speak for him. So he was a great, I, I would never call him a mid card guy cause that would be disrespectful, but he was great at being like that seventh match on the card. Mm. Cause you're going to get a really good match before the really big stars mm. come out in match nine and match 10. Mm. Um, so I, I used to use him as, as an example a lot because you have to be able to do everything. But as far as in-ring, I would put him and Kurt Angle, you know, maybe one, two. And then when you look at the match that they had together, well, they had many matches together, but I think it was the Royal Rumble, was that? I think it was. It was one of the greatest matches in WWE history. No doubt. He, so good. There's only been a few times where I've gone out onto the floor to watch something, and his comeback um, – at Madison Square Garden, along with Triple H's comeback at Madison Square Garden, it was different times, oh, but yeah. mm -hmm. um, was amazing, absolutely amazing. When you think of the era that you were in WWE, you were there for some of the biggest moments ever. Mm -hmm. Do you recall what some of those moments were where you were either peeking through the curtain or you had to be standing around the monitors because you knew something big was happening? Uh, there's several. Uh, probably the biggest one was, was Rock Hogan. And I'll never forget. I was there, by the way. Were you really? I'm from Toronto, yeah. <laughs> so I was 18 years old. It's WrestleMania 18. So you yeah. remember it. And, and what I remember is we got to do the – we came up with a segment where I was, you know, saying my prayers and eating my vitamins, and I called God G. And, and I remember Rock used to laugh at that when we were backstage. He goes, I can't believe you're going to call God G. And, but we did that. We did that. And I walked out onto the floor because I knew they'd been working the entire week in the hotel because they always set up a ring at the hotel. Um, and I knew what the match was supposed to look like. And people maybe to this day don't even realize that when they're talking trash for that 10 minutes, it was a full 10 minutes, maybe longer, that they were barking back and forth. Rock was changing the match because every – 
superstar has to go in either as a heel or a baby face. Yeah. And you fight a certain way as yeah. a heel or a baby face. As a baby face, I would never punch you in the face. As a heel, I'd punch you in the face all day. Yeah. That's just one little detail. So you have to know how to fight that way. So when you train the entire week one certain way, yeah. and all of a sudden the fans are telling you different. Yeah. How many people are in the moment that are good enough and confident enough to change the match completely? Yeah. Rock was. Yeah. So that was one. Triple H's return at Madison Square Garden. I've never heard an arena – uh, louder than that. That was I get goosebumps to this day about that. He came uh, back so early too, like eight no, months, right? Yeah, nobody yeah. thought he could possibly even be there. Correct. Like maybe he could make an appearance, but to wrestle, get out of here. <laughs> One of the most incredible feats that I ever saw, as well. Again, most people would never know this. Is we used to go to Europe twice a year, April and November, 10 days, 10 different shows. And John Cena just became like the world champion. Well, Ric Flair got his hooks into him. And he's like, if you're going to be the world champion, you got to act like a world champion. You got to pay for all the drinks. You're going to make the most money on the, you know, and you get paid. And for a guy like Cena, he's going to make 30 to 50 grand a night as the main event. So you're talking wow. 10, 10 days. He's yeah. going to make between three and five hundred thousand dollars, yeah. and then we all would get paid six months later after it would sit in an account, and that's how the foreign shows worked, right? So Cena, who never drank before, all of a sudden he's drinking every single night, and he's paying for the the, the hotel, and I'm watching, I'm like, we're all, and he just keeps paying and paying and paying. So we get to the the ninth night, and I asked him, I said, I said, John, I said, how much money have you spent on this trip? He goes, yeah. well, I checked my account today, and it was thirty five thousand. Wow. And I said, thirty five thousand dollars. He goes, 35,000 pounds, which back then it was like two to one. So yeah. it was like $70,000. So on the last night, it's Sunday night. We have Monday Night Raw the next night, drinking again at the bar. All of a sudden, Dean Malenko walks up, whispers something in his ear, and Cena takes the beer, sets it on the <laughs> counter, walks to the elevator, disappears. And I said, Dean, what did you just say to him? He goes, well, we just got a call from Vince, and he's going 60 minutes tomorrow night with <laughs> Shawn Michaels in an Ironman match. <laughs> so the next night, I'm waiting because me and – there was a time where me and John were really tight. We traveled together, um, and I really enjoyed his company. And so I'm waiting because that's kind of what you did. Somebody has a special match or a special time. You want to be there. He comes out. You could smell the alcohol <laughs> coming out of his pores. But to his, his credit, him and Shawn Michaels, if people go back and watch it, had an absolute, uh, just a magic match for 60 minutes. And he had been drinking nonstop for nine days. The last interview I did with Ric Flair, Flair said that Vince pulled Cena aside and said, you can't hang with Ric Flair anymore. <laughs> you, you can't. And he was also the first guy on the bus in the morning to go to the gym. So he would drink Damn. till 3 or 4 a.m. And he'd be on the bus first one to go to the gym. Wow. He, he was an absolute beast. Cena was a beast. In his prime, like when he was there every single day, beast. There's two things that I think made you so incredibly successful in WWE. Number one was you were never afraid to make yourself the butt of the joke. Sure. So if, if it happened to be like you doing that Divas challenge where you're doing the obstacle course and <laughs> falling on your face, you do it. 100%. If it's The Rock making you do the Charleston, by the way, did he talk you through that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so a couple of things. I'm a big Barry Manilow fan. Okay. So the greatest part about wrestling is you try to take your real life into the storylines, if possible, right? Mm -hmm. So what is better than making fun of a black man for the whitest music that you could possibly listen to? And so that's how we came up with that. He's like, you like Barry? Because The Rock's a big country music fan and has never been, you know. So we thought it would be funny. And out of that, I actually got a call from Barry Manilow's touring manager or whatever. And they gave me two tickets to the <laughs> Barry Manilow. I swear, this is a true story. <laughs> true story. And I went and saw him at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Like three weeks after after that particular segment, were you doing the Charleston? With no, him? I wasn't. I wasn't doing the Charleston. No. That's good. But yeah, yeah. But to to your point, and this is what makes me laugh sometimes, but also it can be frustrating. Is that people on social media that I'll just give out, and most of the time I just do it because I know that there's eighty percent of the public just has nothing better to do than spend their time on social media. Sure. So it's more of an interaction thing, but. Wrestling fans, again, who think they're the smartest people in the room. Oh, what do you know? You were just the guy that always they made fun of. You were a joke. You were this. You're the. Can you imagine if you walked up to one of those people, most of the, you know, and said, listen, 
I'm going to give you an opportunity. Mm. You're going to be on TV with The Rock. And this is what we're going to do. How many of those people, A, would say no, or B, wouldn't call every person they know to say, guess what I get to do tonight, but yet they want to make fun of, of what I did? It's acting. That's what pro wrestling is. And you're playing a character. And so now, 15 years later after I left, that's, that's your take. Yeah. That shows how little some people even know about the business, which is why you should watch and enjoy and not think that you're the know-it-all. Because if you're making fun of me, I spent three years next to the greatest entertainer, perhaps of all time, in yeah. the WWE. And I'm, I'm the butt of the joke? I don't think so. What did it look like before those promos would start? Would he say, all right, team me up with this question, or I'm going to go here with, with, this, with this part? It, it was a process. So, so Brian Gerwitz, who now runs his, his company, they were as close as close could be. So they would work out the scenario. Then they would bring me into it. And at first, obviously, I didn't have a say. And then after they started trusting me, I, I started to have a say because the stuff I did was fairly entertaining. It's still, people still talk about it today. So... Um, I, but the first one, I, I didn't. But as we went along, and maybe my favorite one of all of the ones that we did was SmackDown was taped. But The Rock was one of maybe the only one that there was no question. His promos were always going to be live, mm. even though the show's taped. Because you have to have that crowd interaction. And you also had to do it at a place in the, in the building where he could hear the crowd go millions and millions and millions. Like, all that had to be in real time. Yeah. So we were doing a, where he was going to grab the microphone from me, like this microphone, and there's you know, this cord. Yeah. So he grabs it like this, pulls it out of my hand, and like an idiot, I'm still holding this part of it. So The Rock's holding this. And so now Kevin Dunn, our producer, is screaming in my ear, put it back together, put it back together, put it back together. So Rock doesn't even miss a beat. Doesn't even miss a beat. He just goes, hmm. Takes it, takes it out of my hand. And as, only the rock could, as only The Rock could do, it fits perfectly the first time. Three prongs, perfect. And then he goes, boom, 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 boom. Make sure it's working. Yeah. Now, as The Rock was saying, right, he paused so he knew there'd be an edit point. Mm. So when I tell people next level thinking, next level performing, being the absolute very best, it's all in the details. The mm. Rock knew if he paused, made sure it was working, started again, that's a perfect edit point because he knew the show is taped. Yeah. See how it all trickles down? And people are like, oh, I know everything. No. It's, 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 it's next level type of stuff that, that we did back then. The second thing that makes you so good at what you do is broadcasting is all about storytelling. Yep. And you are easily the best storyteller that I know. I mean, it's been an example here for the last 56 minutes. It's just the great <laughs> stories that you're telling here. But you're such a good storyteller. And even if you're only given 30 seconds on air to tell a story, you find a way to weave in all these little details and make the story so good. Details matter in entertainment. And everybody that works with me or for me at CBS now, I tell them all the time, figure out a way. I give them 45 seconds. They're like, oh, but it's a podcast. No, this is a TV show, and this is where we're going. Don't think about where we are. Think about where we're going. Mm -hmm. And when you get on TV, you can't talk as long as you want. And on wrestling shows, you can't talk as long as you want. And you might only have, and I hear The Miz talk about this all the time, I don't care if you give me 10 seconds, 15 seconds, I'm going to make you remember me. Mm. And so that's why nobody's ever written anything for me. Like I always put it into my own voice, whether it was at WWE or Sports Center or whatever, because I know how I talk and how the coach talks. And I took that very, very seriously. And if you can't storytell and you can't make people feel something, because yeah. in life it's all about feeling something. How, how sad would it be to go through life? And, and I feel bad for people that are working jobs that they hate because I've never had a day of that. Even though I had that year that I told you I didn't really feel comfortable going back, I still loved it. Yeah. I still, you know, it, it's, it's all relative, you know. And I'm, I spent 10 years at ESPN doing Sports Center, doing radio, doing Mike and Mike, doing First Take. Loved every second of it. So how, how can I complain? But to be able to do all of that, to be able to have a radio show or have a podcast or learn how to speak in 30 or 45 second sound bites, yeah. it's a skill. Yeah. I still practice to this day in the mirror. And I tell people all the time, you want to be great? You want to be really good? Because so many people sit at home and go, oh, I wish I could be Chris Van Vliet. I wish I could be the coach. I wish I could do what they do but yet they never do anything about it. Yep. Storytelling is an art form. Learn how to do it. And details, 
details are everything doing it in real time. It's amazing to me how many people want to be a broadcaster or especially now want to be a content creator and don't take that video camera that's in their pocket take it out and just record themselves every day, 30 seconds, a minute of just like getting comfortable of seeing yourself on camera and getting used to like, yeah, your eyebrow does that weird thing when you talk or like one side of your mouth goes up when you speak, 100%. like do it once a day for the next 30 days and you'll be a much better, more confident presenter in 30 days from now. Pretend it's you're working out. Pretend you're in the gym. And when yeah. you're in the gym, are you going to get results in one day yeah. or is it going to be 30 days? Yeah. No. But to me, this is the essence of this business. And the business has changed so much that if you can't story tell and you're not good on camera, guess what? The executives that are trying to figure out, because now there's never been less on-air jobs in the history of time uh, than right now. Yes. There's never been, you know, I, I speak to college kids all the time. Well, what do I do? I don't know where to go. I, you know, I can't get that first gig. And I was like, I drove three hours with a car that probably shouldn't have made it to make $12 an hour for my first TV job. I said, you've got to do whatever it takes. I just talked to a kid the other day, and he was like, yeah, coach, I want to do it, but, but I, I live here in whatever state he was living in, and I don't want to move. And I looked at him, I said, then you don't want to be in this business. Yep. I said, you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes, including working on your craft yep. all the time. I, and I'll look at the camera for this one. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And I think that that's a yep. big thing. Like, you talk about driving three hours for your first job. I drove... A hundred miles each way for my first internship, which was unpaid, and got my old high school job at the in the fish department of a pet store at the mall, scooping dead goldfish <laughs> to pay for the gas for my internship. And it's amazing to me how many people aren't willing to do that. Almost none are, and that's why I said I'm lucky to still look as young as I am. But because of my talent that I know I have and that I've proven for years. Mm -hmm. All these kids that are coming out now that think, oh, I'm getting a check from YouTube because I was able to prank this person or whatever. They think they're an on-air talent. Mm. You're not an on-air talent. An on-air talent is able to stand in front of a camera and either host or have a panel or deliver, be able to toss to commercials or read a promo correctly. Not just read it, but read it correctly. If somebody's going to pay you to be a presenting sponsor, you need to make it worth their while. Yeah. All of that stuff is now what you have to be willing to do and able to do if you want to be here in this business. I think the biggest thing about broadcasting is they can say to a broadcaster, you've got four minutes and you need to do this, 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 and this. And you go, oh, yeah, no problem. Easy. I told somebody this the other day, my very first job, Cake TV, Channel 10 in Wichita, Kansas. And, and we used to work all day to do two and a half minutes. And we had these big three-quarter <laughs> yeah, tapes back yeah, in the day, yeah. and you're carrying them down. And I think now, if, if somebody said to us, Chris, or, or Coach, you and Chris have to do four minutes, yeah. and you've got to hit these four topics, we wouldn't even blink an eye. We could do it, and we'd move on down the road. Absolutely. And that shows the evolution of, of the talent. Also, learning how to do it, learning how to speak. You don't even – I tell kids all the time, make sure when the red light's on that you're on. Yeah. Well, you and I are at a point, it doesn't matter if the red light's on or the red light's off. Yeah. We're going to be ready to go. Yes. And I think that another big thing, especially with, like, interviews or, or just doing things, especially in person now, is the second you walk in the door, the second you see that person, you've got to bring the energy. Mm -hmm. You can't sit here and wait until – Okay, okay, we're live now. All right, let's, let's, let's hype it up now. <laughs> You've got to bring that energy because that person's going to meet your energy. That is such a great point. And I, I don't know if it's frustration or if it's just maybe they're not trained, but I had a couple of professors that were very angry with me because I'm honest with these kids. And I tell them all the time that you have to be ready because at no point do you know if somebody's going to come into the room yeah. and be – somebody that can help you mm. or somebody that can uh wants to hire you yeah you never know nobody's going to come to your front door and not going to say here's a million dollars you got to leave that front door and go out into the world and you've got to earn that money whatever that money is yeah. but you've got to be prepared to do it mm. and most kids today are not and there's a lot of kids i have a guy that works with me he's amazing his name's Sia Najad. we call him the counselor of cash that's his nickname love the nickname yeah, so the reason, good right why do you think we call him the counselor of cash I, you tell me. Well, he was a practicing attorney for 12 years that got into sports fantasy and then sports betting, and he realized 
I'm miserable over here, mm. but man, I love it over here. Mm. So how do I make that transition? Because financially, when you have two kids and a wife and all that kind of stuff, and that's what I love now is to try to get people to get into this business that maybe we're trying something else yeah. and they want to go do this now, not just kids coming out of college. So when we're talking about like getting everything in in a limited amount of time, We've all heard the stories of what it's like to be on WWE commentary. Yeah. What are you actually hearing? What is Vince actually saying slash yelling in your ear? <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot, a lot. Uh, the more he trusts you, the more he's going to lay out. Um, but in the height of when I was doing it, because uh, they moved me around. I did Sunday Night Heat, then I did Monday Night Raw, and you know, and and obviously Jr. is the greatest. And he would still scream at Jr. Wow. And I got so good because Vince would say something, and if you didn't say it, because he wanted you to say it then, not wait for Jr. to get done, not wait for King to get done. I want you to say it now. So after a while, I was like, I don't care if Jr. and King are mad at me. I don't want to get screamed at by Vince anymore. So he'd be, he'd say something, and I was so good at regurgitating it that I would say it within a second, probably. I could talk as he was talking in my ear. That's how good we got together. But there'd be sometimes if you said, if you didn't tell the story the way he wanted you to tell the story, because mm. this business is all about stories, as we talked about. Yeah. And he, you just ruined his character. You just killed him. You just ruined it. Like That's the kind of stuff he'd scream at you if you told a story the wrong way, which is why it was so paramount. And he's, for, he's screaming that as you're trying to do commentary. Correct, correct. The show's going on. Oh. It's at a big spot in the match, and he's screaming at you, and you're trying to get back on track. And it was paramount to meet with the, the agents and the superstars who were wrestling. We had to, you'd go around during the day and meet with all of them because you had to know the story they were telling. And the really great ones can have a match and tell a great story. Mm. And if you're just watching, you're like, man, this is amazing. But the commentary adds to it. Were there certain things that you weren't allowed to say? Because now they say there's a lot of words you're not allowed to say. 100%. Um, and they would, not only did we have a list of them, you kind of knew. Do you, rem do you remember some of them? Do I, I don't. I don't. I have, I have like a big block. I, I, and, <laughs> and I wish I was kidding, but I do. I, I have a big block uh, from, uh, I don't even know why. But it was, there was just. There's a big one now of like you can't say fans. It's the what WWE it? universe. Universe. Yeah. Well, that's all. That goes back to the branding. Sure. And it, it makes, you know, and, and when we switched over they from. Don't, they don't say hospitals. It's a local medical cool. facility. <laughs> <laughs> there were some things that were a little extreme, but you, you have to understand there was always a reason sure, sure. and a method for the madness. So um, for, for us, it was more about not saying things about their character. Gotcha. As opposed to particular words that you couldn't say were there certain things that really helped with elevating the storytelling when you were in a match like I remember my friend got one tiny little piece of feedback from JR and he said make every near fall matter mm -hmm. and, and now he's a much better commentator as a result of that but like no matter what you're talking about no matter what the story is oh oh one two oh he kicked out it would always be that always you have to call every kick out okay if you don't then especially for the really big matches where the kickouts were at two and a half or two and three quarters or whatever, yeah. you had to uh, make sure that it felt like it could end at any point. And that's why you see some matches, like with Brock Lesnar perhaps, that are really, really quick. And the reason they do some of those is for that reason. A match could end quickly. Mm. And it has, because if it never had, then you wouldn't have any examples, right? Yeah. So that was the thing is call every single, and it doesn't matter if you're interrupting your, your guys, that's the play-by-plays guy's job yeah. is to call every false finish and make it matter mm. yeah what do you think is the best piece of advice that you tell to young broadcasters or someone that's looking to get into the business a couple of things the first one be willing to go anywhere to do anything this business is so hard now to get into, whether it's the WWE or whether it's regular sports, whatever it is, because now with technology and all these different things, networks are trying to say, how, how many human beings do we need to pull this off? Yeah. So I tell them, I don't care where it is. That's why I don't encourage people to, 
to lock themselves down when they're 22 years old. I never, if you want to get married, whatever you want to, I don't care. But if you want to do this business, you can't do that yeah. because if you have children, you can't go make $12,000 a year in Yuma, Arizona to learn. I tell kids, go find an honor your job. I don't care where it is. Don't sign a long-term contract. Okay, don't. But the bottom line is, if you go to a small place, they're not going to have the money to sue you if you leave anyway. But you need tape. Yeah. You need tape. So start before. Go to a school that has a really good broadcasting program yeah. that has cameras, that has tapes, and make your tape. Because yeah. we have a young lady. Her name's Mackenzie Brooks, and she's amazing. She just got out of school. She's really good on camera, and we can, you know, kind of train her as she's working for us. So she's fantastic. But not everybody's like her. Not everybody's ready to do it at that level. Mm. So you've got to go wherever. I don't care where it is. If you're not willing to do that, you can't work in this business. I'll add one more on there. It's I was so grateful to be able to make mistakes when I worked in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada <laughs> on Chex TV. Like I was so grateful to be able to be terrible right. yes. when very few people were watching. Correct. Correct. And that and that's the and me and me too. I mean, yeah. in Wichita, Kansas is a bigger mar market, 62, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's pretty big. But you can still make some mistakes yeah. and try out the the personality stuff, which in local TV nobody allows or used to, yeah. but now they do. Now they do. Did you ever get in trouble with Vince? Um, <laughs> like real trouble? I don't know. Like, uh, you know. Yeah, there, there, <laughs> yeah. There's one story that still kind of rubs me the wrong way to this day, and back between you know after 9/11 uh, unfortunately there obviously there was a war and we started going to Afghanistan in the Middle East or Iraq and and it was supposed to be a volunteer trip so i went i actually wrestled rick flair in afghanistan one one particular trip and Again, I was right next to Vince. It was three groups of six. And I'm like, man, I'm, I, I never said no. I took pride. I never say no. I'm the ultimate team player. Yeah. So I get married, and my wife is pregnant with our first child. And, again, they said, hey, if you don't feel comfortable going, you, there's no pressure whatsoever. Yeah. But do you believe that? <laughs> so they didn't believe it. I told them from the jump. I never said I was going. I said, Nope. I show up the day and they take your bags and because it has to go through screening at the Pentagon or whatever. And they're like, where's your bag? And I was like, I told you, we thought you were kidding. I said, at what point did you ever think I was kidding? Did I ever laugh? Did I ever not look you in the eye and say, I'm not going? There's like, you've never told us no before. Because my wife's pregnant. Thank you. Yeah. And she didn't feel comfortable. Yeah. So they had to scramble at the last minute. You got to get passports. It's a whole big thing. I think it was actually Chris Masters that they that took my spot on that particular trip, if I remember correctly. But I should have known. I should have known that it wasn't just going to end there. So fast forward a week, and at that time I was out doing commentary, and the show ends, and the Undertaker ends the show, and he's getting ready to walk up the ramp, and the referee comes over, and, he says, and the music's playing. He's like, go hit uh, Taker from the back. Go hit Taker. I'm like, why would I do that? That makes no sense. They're like, Vince is telling. Oh, there oh. it is. So he was angry that I told him no, and that I went against, you know, God forbid you say no to anybody – especially Vince. And so, like the team player that I am, I go over, I attack the Undertaker, he turns around, apologizes to me, and says, I'm sorry, I don't want to do it, throws me in, proceeds to, to beat me up. And as he gets done, Batista's music hits. Down comes Batista. He does the same thing. He gives me his three finishes. I was so irate. You know that few times in life where you get so angry, you start to cry? Mm -hmm. Like it's just your, your emotions are just overwhelming. That was one of those moments, and I didn't sell. I mean, I just took like five finishes from the two two of the biggest stars of all time. Yeah, I got up and walked to the back, like just in like completely disrespecting them. Uh, but I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I was thinking, how can, how can I get beat up when for all these years I was completely loyal? Um, but yeah, that was that was one of the times where uh, I was so angry because I, I I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. Do you think Vince is going to keep doing this? He says he wants to do it till he's 120. We, we always used to joke uh, on the road that he'll die on the road because you got to understand he's, he's a very unique individual. And when you build something and it's your baby, yeah. um, you don't want to see it end. And I always knew he was going to come back or he'd figure out a way for it to come back um, because this is his legacy yeah. and this is what he wants. Now, do I think that maybe he'll regret a few things when it's all said and done? I think so. I, I feel think like he has no regrets. I, I, think, I think he should. 
And what I mean by that is we all want to have friends around us. We all want to have our families around us and we all want to do good. And as we get a little bit older, you should get a little bit wiser and you should not be the idiots we were, you know, 20 years ago. And we all did dumb things, including myself. But even if you're the boss, and this is something I used to say about Vince that, that I find very sad, is I pride myself on having friends that I can call and watch the game. Mm. Hey, big game Saturday night, you want to watch it? Yeah. He doesn't have anybody like that. He's never had anybody like that. He, and is he a football fan? Probably not. But I'm just saying, you understand my point. Yeah. Just to have somebody come over and break bread, have a drink, watch a game, do anything. Yeah. It was always based off of people like Pat Patterson was his best friend. We all loved Pat, but are you watching the game with Pat? Mm. You know what I mean? We love, and so everything that is Vince's life is all pro wrestling. And I found that a little bit sad, despite all the money. Despite all the money, I found that a little bit sad. So you're saying he's the guy who only has work friends. Correct. We all know somebody like that. 100%. 100%. And, and, and what's sad is that as he's gotten older, I think he's 77 now. So I met him, like I said, on his 54th birthday. So wow. I've known Vince for almost 25 years. And – I, I, I do believe that if you put a lie detector on him when it's all said and done, that he wishes maybe um, he would have made more friends or not. Because he's very awkward to be around. You can't have a conversation, like a normal conversation, because you're so intimidated, mm. whatever the word is. And a lot of people just, it, it's always that thing, hey, pal, you know, is that instead of like a real conversation. So him and I had a lot of real conversations, but I was around him a lot and got mm. through that initial that initial wall. Does he like do normal person things? Like, does he eat pizza? I have no idea because he, <laughs> he, he never hung out with anybody. And I wow. know that he had all, during, so during the day, just so you know, he would have, and it's one of my favorite people in the world, Harvey Whippleman, one of the famous yeah. managers. He's got Rock his first car. He, his, his personal job was to make sure Vince was taken care of to this day. And so he would bring in the food, and then if superstars like The Rock wanted a specific chicken or something, he would buy it for them too. And you'd see, you'd see Bruno walking, the, people, Bruno Lauer's name, walking through with all these steaks and potatoes. So Vince wouldn't even eat with the rest of us. It would all be in his office uh, on the road every single so week. So he could keep working, I'm 100%. sure. 100%. Yeah. It's like he has no off switch. Correct. Wow. Correct. Look, I feel like we could talk forever. I told you we would talk for an hour, and here we are at an hour 15. But I think we've got some time. Yeah, we got time. We got to we yeah. still tear down and hang out and take a photo. <laughs> You're the best. I, and I appreciate you being who you are. Thank you. I, I appreciate you being the genuine person you are and the great storyteller that you are. <laughs> I feel like you could tell each story for an hour. Like Every single story could be a podcast in itself. I, I do believe this, Chris, that, that part of – having these experiences experiences is to be able to tell a good story because the one thing I want people to understand and remember if I never do an interview like this again because I don't do too many anymore is that you only have one life to live and that is very cliche but knowing that and knowing everything that I've been through in the WWE whether it's losing friends to drug addictions, whether it's losing friends to uh, brain situations, whether it's just tragedy, whatever it is, or the good things too. All of that stuff happens and you never know when it's going to happen. Yeah. So part of the reason I love telling these stories is A, I've survived it. Yeah. B, I lived it then. C, we had 50 or 60 people at all, always at one time. And I want people to understand you can still do that. You can still enjoy your life. You can still go out and do whatever it is you want to do. But the one thing that I'll never do that I'm super proud of is I'll never say when I'm 75 years old, I wish I would have. Mm. I wish I would have tried being a TV broadcaster. I wish I would have tried doing that. I wish I would have tried doing this. Because now when I walk into any building, any interview, any set of executives, I know I belong. Mm. And it's because of everything I've done before it. I hope people understand that, that instead of just sitting on the sidelines and either complaining or trolling or hating or whatever, get in the game. Yeah. Get in the game and stop worrying about that and start doing something that's fun. Because how many people do you know that are miserable because they're doing jobs that they have to do to take care of their family members, not that they want to do? Yep. I've always done things that I want to do and I have to do. Yeah. And that's a beautiful place to be. I love that, and we're, especially now, because we're living in a time where you can monetize just about anything. Mm -hmm. 
You don't have to do a job that you hate. You can do the job you hate while doing the thing you love on the side. And then at some point, maybe the thing that you love flips and becomes the main thing. But my goodness, what a miserable life that would be. I had somebody tell me the, the other day, and, and this, this was so telling to me. He was probably 22, 22, 23 years old, and he had a normal job. And he goes, I want to start this. And it was like a podcast or something. And I said, anybody can start it. Yep. I said, <laughs> but there's a good chance you won't finish it. Because it's so easy to just go, oh, nobody's listening, nobody's watching. I said, do it to practice on camera, even if you don't get one person listening. And he was like, but, and I could see him thinking about it. And he's like, but I'd have to work like 10, 12 hours a day. I already have a normal job. And I was like, you don't want it. You don't want it. I said, you don't, I said, you like the idea of it, yeah. but you don't truly want it. There's nobody that can go and start a podcast or start a show and make $100,000 the first year. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Are you willing to put in the work? And most aren't. 90% of podcasts stop after seven episodes. And then 90% of the ones that continue stop after seven more. Really? Because think about it. it it's, it's difficult. And you know this. Yeah. If you're doing interviews, you got to book the guest, research for the guest, sit down here and actually do it. Then you got to produce it, upload it, you know, uh, promote it. There's so many steps. And if you don't love every single one of them, you're going to go, ah, it's not really worth it this week. 100%. Yeah. And, you, and you can't be that guy. And, and that's the problem with, I don't even want to call them millennials because there's a lot of adults that are trying to, to change. Yeah. And they're always looking at the views and and the money. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to do it. Really? Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's that's the message that I try to get out because now I'm in a position where I know that I'm going to be good, right? But now it's time to help. Yeah. Because now when you start to be in charge of things, there's so many executives that, that just didn't do a good job when I was coming up and through. And I took notes on all of them. And now I want to be an executive someplace and help and help yeah. these young people and, and also be honest with them. We're not honest with anybody anymore. We're saying, oh, that was really good when it wasn't or that was really bad when yeah. it was really good, right? It's like we need people to truly help and that's what I'm trying to do now. My biggest fear when I was in my senior year of college, I woke up one day and I was having the best time in college, right? I woke up one day and it hit me. Oh my God, when we graduate, we gotta go to work <laughs> yeah. for you know the next 40 or 50 years of our life. My biggest fear was going to a job that I didn't enjoy going to. 100%. I didn't want to be one of those people who hated Sunday because, oh, my God, I got to wake up for work on Monday morning. That was what drove me. Not that 100%. I wanted to like my job or love my job. I just didn't want to hate my job. 100%. 100%. And that, that little part still drives me. Yeah. There's always in this business, there's always that little part of uh, paranoia or uh, – your confidence slips just a little bit or you feel like, oh, I'm not doing things the right way. You just got to get through it, but you got to work at it. Yep. Damn it. Do you got to work? And at I it. know there's a lot of people that are listening to this going, well, it must be nice for you. It's like, what do you, it must be nice to put in the work. Like that's the thing. I have three jobs now. I have three jobs now. And it would be easy for me just to do my day job at CBS, but I love golf that much. So when I go do a PGA Tour event now and I do eight to ten a year, yeah. do you think I don't do my day job when I'm there? Yeah. No, no, no. I still do my show. I just have equipment now, just like you do with your show, yeah. that we can travel. Are you willing to travel? Yeah. Are you willing to do it when you're doing another job? Are you willing to do it when I do PFL? That's a nighttime, so I can still do PGA Tour my show before that, yep. get off, go back to my room, and still do PFL. So I did three yeah. shows in one day once. Are you willing to do that? And it comes back to the very start of this conversation. You do the hard stuff in private yep. so that in public it looks easy. I tell my son all the time, let somebody else tell your story. I said, you don't have to tell that person you just shot a 75. Let somebody else tell it because then that's how people go, man, that, guy, that guy's really, really good, and you don't have to say anything. That's how good you want to be. What's that phrase, and I'm, I'm going to just you know, kind of put my own spin on it, but it's something like when you think you're good, you tell other people. When you are good, other people tell you. 100%. And I've been so blessed, as have you, to work with unbelievably talented people yeah. and just to be in a comfort zone that are just that you just you just get it yeah. you just get it and i i'm envious of people that make it look easy which yeah. is why i started doing it myself yeah. when you go to a concert and it's beyonce or taylor swift or kenny chet or whoever yeah and you're like man they make it look really really easy yeah. and you know it's not 
They, and they're operating on just a completely different level. Hundred percent. And you are too, my friend. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And this has been fun. I, I love telling these stories and 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 looking back on on the years that I've had, but also know that that we still have a lot of work to do. You're one of my favorite guests to have on here. I could have you on every few months. <laughs> uh, maybe we will. I mean, we we don't live far from each other. Well, there's still a lot of stories I've never told. So uh, if if you keep having me on, we'll keep uh, diving deeper. So the question I end every conversation with is around gratitude because it's such a big, important part of my life. It's the center focus of my life. What are three things in your life that you're grateful for? Wow. Um, well, first and foremost, my family's amazing. Um, I have great kids um, that are just the best. Uh, I told you my dad had a heart transplant. So try to imagine you're, you talk about grateful. You're planning a trip. Your whole family's going home. You're getting ready to put him in hospice. This is a true story, and I'll end on this. And he had never qualified for the, the transplant list, ever. He's 72 years old, right? So my mom calls me, and my mom's one of those people who you, you got to have 30 minutes when you pick up the phone, right? So I pick up, Mom, I'm really busy. No, 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 I need, I need to talk to you. She goes, we're going to try one more time to get Dad on the on – the, but if, when you come back on Friday, this is what it's going to look like. And it wasn't good. And they qualified somehow. Wow. But there were 800 people on the list, right? 800. So that's Tuesday. Thursday, we get a call. Dad just got a heart. What? On day three? My dad has, for 45 years, his life is all about service, gratitude. And that's all he's ever done. It's never been about himself, ever. He adopted three children because my mom was told she couldn't have kids. And then they get pregnant with my little sister. And I believe it's because they give three of us a life they never would have had. Mm -hmm. He gets a, a heart on day three because somehow he matches with pretty much any blood type, any heart, anything like that. He jumps the list, and in four days, he got a new heart. So Christmas of 2020, imagine that Christmas we had wow. because my dad was going from probably passing away to living. So you talk about grateful. That's That's been my world the last four wow. years. So when somebody complains about, oh, you know, this happened on your show, I don't care. I don't care. I want to have fun. I want to enjoy myself. And my dad has taught me, help as many people as you can in the space that you can. Mm. Don't try to get outside of your space. So I know in my space, I try to help anybody that comes and asks for it. I try to do whatever I can. Yeah. So family, that's number one. Family's number one. I'm, I'm very grateful for the career that I've had because without the career, you can't take care of your family. So I love people who go, oh, the money doesn't matter. Well, you got to earn a living, right? Yeah. And, and I'm grateful that I'm in a good headspace. After all the years in the WWE, so many guys aren't. Yeah. And it's something that's not talked about a lot. But I'm, I'm glad that I came through. I mean, a full 10 years I was there, you know, the first time. Yeah. And, and I'm very proud of the fact that I never called in sick. I only missed one Monday in 10 years. So I made it 519 out of 520. And, and the only one I missed was on my honeymoon. <laughs> but imagine the dedication to that. And I want other people to understand that dedication. So I'm grateful that I've been healthy enough to do that. I think the, the last thing is uh, I'm really grateful for the people that I've started to put around me. Because uh, before, I didn't have the best people around me. I was yeah. all about fun, all about you know doing really stupid things. And now I realize if I put the right people around me, um, they can lift me up, I can lift them up, and there's nothing that we can't do. Yeah. Uh, so I think those would be the three things that, that right now I'm most grateful for. You lift everybody up whose life that you touch, whether it's a conversation like this in person, whether someone's just listening to this or watching this. I love that. You are, you are the brightest light, and I love that I'm able to share a little bit of that light today. Well, thank you. And for all the wrestling fans who hate me, um, you, we're completely blowing that reputation up right now today because they all think I'm this jerk, and that's fine. Let them think that. But at the core, it's just not true. I, feel, just I not think true. they hate the character. Yeah, I, well, I, that's my point. Yeah. Is but sometimes they can't separate it. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. We're gonna keep loving everybody, and and in this day and age when everything morphs together, and now uh, I think the last thing that I'm most proud of yeah. is that before I left the WWE. It was such a hard thing to, once you decided to go there, to get back into regular sports. And that's what a lot of people have to think about, yep. is if I go do wrestling, can I still go to ESPN or Fox or wherever? And we knocked that door in. And I was the first one, a full-time ESPN contract, and, and now so many others have yep. done it. So when you can pave the way on a road that didn't even have a road before, yeah. you got you, you, you to take the wins when you can get them, and I'm super proud of that.
my friend. So good to see you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Awesome.